Thank you so much for coming uh, Friday night in London. I'm so delighted to see so many of you here. Um, it is an enormous, enormous privilege and a pleasure to be sitting on this stage with, with Richard Powers. Um, and a writer who I think is, it's fair to say that if you haven't read anything by Richard Powers, he is the most important writer that you should read. Oh my goodness. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Um, so, Richard, I, I'm going to do a very quick um, introduction to, to the book, and, and then we're going to hear a reading, and then, we, and then we're going we're to talk. So this book, Bewilderment, uh, which if you haven't bought already, I urge you to do. It's, you know, I'm, I'm one of those people that feels it's really important to, to press books into people's hands that have meant something to me, and, and, and this one meant actually quite a lot to me, um, so I, I would be pressing it into people's hands, um, although I'm going to get him to sign this one, so I'm not going to press this one into your hands. Um, so this is a book that's set in the, in the near future, but, a, but an America that is uh, incredibly familiar to us. Uh, narrated by Theo Byrne, who is an astrobiologist whose search for life on other planets feels increasingly futile in the face of the coming collapse here on Earth. And of course, he fears for his nine-year-old son, Robin, who is considered by, not considered, consumed by many things, but also most urgently, grief after the death of his mother. And the fate of the planet is something that utterly, utterly consumes this nine-year-old. And it was something that his mother too was engaged in. It, it is a book that forays into the science fiction world, but is, it is also a book that forces us to consider what we are doing with the planet and what it means to be human, which I think the best fiction hmm. does. Um, uh, Richard, the, 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 the most affecting part of the book in terms of not the big ideas, which I of course want to focus on in this talk, but in terms of the characterization and and what moved me the most is, of course, the relationship between Theo and, and Robin, the father and the son. I, I want you, just before you do a reading, just to tell us what the germ of that was. You are not a man who has children, but this is clearly something that was sparked by a particular thing that happened mm. to you. And I, I wonder if you'll just share with us the germ right. of this particular idea for the story. So... I had begun the book shortly uh, before lockdown, and I was carrying over from my previous novel, The Overstory, this sense that our, our literature, our, our uh, belletristic uh, literary fiction, needed to recover the more than human in its storytelling. You know, we, needed, we needed to find a way to tell personal stories about ourselves, but to bring us back, land us back on Earth, to resituate us among the neighbors and to, to remember uh, the kinds of things that most fiction has known over most of human history, which is you can't talk about us without talking about where we are and the, the more than human that we depend upon for our existence. So I had started out uh, with a, a germ of, of an idea which will probably come up in conversation at this, uh, tonight. Um, and I had begun uh, sketching and then writing in earnest and I probably had a hundred pages or so uh, telling a story about what this shift in consciousness, this retrieval of a, of a kind of indigenous consciousness might look like. And I had a cast of characters, and I had a situation, and I had a, a milieu, but it wasn't working. And I was increasingly, you know, feeling increasing resistance to sitting down every morning and working. And when that writer's block starts uh, rising, it's a signal to me that I'm, I'm on the wrong track. Uh, these days, because I, I have the great good fortune to, to live in the Smoky Mountains of Southern Appalachia, uh, I don't panic when I feel that. 
Um, uh, it's, it, there, there is much in the world around me to take up the slack of writing and so when the writing stalls it's quite easy to set it down and walk away from it and to go into this half a million acre wilderness in my backyard. And that's what I did for, for several days running. I just walked. And there's something about moving around underneath the trees, breathing in all those volatile organic compounds uh, that puts into context all writer's blocks and, and all anxieties. And I was, uh, one day, I, uh, after, I don't know, probably a week and a half of, of, of uh, just waiting and, and uh, seeing how this might unfold, I was down a path three, four miles. I hadn't seen humans for you know, over an hour. And I felt a, a strange weight on my shoulders. And, and it immediately reminded me of seeing uh, parents uh, on the trails uh, who end up having to carry their children after a while because the children just get too, so tired that the father will put the child up on his shoulders. And I, I, I just, I, I, I had that momentary sympathetic sense of that happening. And I thought, this is very strange. And I imagined the child sort of clambering down and walking alongside me and just being astonished by where I was in the way that I should have been myself. And uh, seeing the river, seeing the heron fishing in the river, uh, the profusion of, of trees and wildflowers. And he looked up at me and, he, and I, I imagine him saying, are you for real? You know, which of course is a question I wanted to ask him. It was very, very <laughs> fleeting. Um, and I've not had that it's so vividly in the past. And I thought, who is this guy? And then I almost immediately realized this is, this is the subject, this is the hero of my book. And I rushed back to the trailhead and uh, went on back home and, and began to think, you know, how would I recast the book, the story that I'm telling with a nine-year-old at the center instead of an adult at the center? Why don't you read from, from the book for us now, just so that people get a sense of mm -hmm. that relationship between Theo and his nine-year-old son, right. Robin. Uh, so as Razia said, the, the, the book focuses on this father-son relationship. It's told in the first person by Theo, who's in his late 30s. Uh, and he's struggling because uh, Robin, uh, whose behavior has always been very intense, uh, is now reaching a kind of breaking point. Uh, he's been thrown out of school for attacking a schoolmate. And uh, because his mother uh, has died two years before the start of the story, uh, he's increasingly angry and increasingly afraid. And it's falling on Theo, who, as a single parent, uh, admits to his own helplessness and confusion about how to raise this boy. And he's getting... Uh, multiple and conflicting uh, opinions and uh, advice from various sources. And this uh, passage occurs very near the beginning of the book, and it treats uh, Theo trying to understand this locked room mystery of, of his nine-year-old. I never believed the diagnoses the doctors settled on my son. When a condition gets three different names over as many decades, when it requires two subcategories to account for completely contradictory symptoms, when it goes from non-existent to the country's most commonly diagnosed childhood disorder in the course of one generation, when two different physicians want to prescribe three different medications, there's something wrong. My Robin didn't always sleep well. He wet the bed a few times a season and it hunched him over with shame. Noises unsettled him. He liked to turn the sound way down on the television, too low for me to hear. He hated when the cloth monkey wasn't on its perch in the laundry room above the washing machine. He poured every dollar of allowance into a trading card game. Collect them all. But he kept the untouched cards in numeric order in plastic sleeves in a special binder. He could smell a fart from across a crowded movie theater. 
He'd focus for hours on minerals of Nevada or the kings and queens of England, anything in tables. He sketched constantly and well, laboring over fine details lost on me. Intricate buildings and machines for a year, then animals and plants. His pronouncements were off-the-wall mysteries to everyone except me. He could quote whole scenes from movies, even after a single viewing. He rehearsed memories endlessly, and every repetition of the details made him happier. When he finished a book he liked, he'd start it again immediately from page one. He melted down and exploded over nothing but he could just as easily be overcome by joy. On rough nights when Robin retreated to my bed, he wanted to be on the side farthest from the endless terrors outside the window. His mother had always wanted the safe side too. He daydreamed, had trouble with deadlines, and yes, he refused to focus on things that didn't interest him. But he never fidgeted or dashed around or talked without stopping. And he could hold still for hours with things he loved. Tell me, what deficit matched up with all that? What disorder explained him? In, in so many ways, that's a, that's a measure of the, the, the love that Theo has for his child, that he doesn't want him to be labeled and, and of course, labelled he is mm. in so many ways by the outside world and, and I suppose we would describe him as neurodivergent. Mm -hmm. um, in, in that he is furious mm. and obsessed with the harm that we are doing mm. to the planet. I, I wonder when you created him whether you feel that in many ways, that is what's missing, that we're not furious and obsessed mm. enough. Yeah. So on, on the one hand, Robin is a very distinctive and, and different boy. And he, he has certainly the psychohistory to account for a lot of the anger and fear. I mean, when you lose a parent at that early age, that goes a long way to describing or to, to accounting for the kinds of trauma that, that in, in, inflect his life and for all the difference in his brain for all the ways in which his behavior really does uh, travel quite far from the mode of any sort of distribution curve that you might want to use to compare him to his same age group he is representative in one way which is he, he is traumatized you know he is, a, is suffering acutely from ecotrauma and that is not an unusual condition. I mean, uh, it is on the rise everywhere. Um, uh, it, it is considered in the States now one of the primary causes of mental health problems among children. And so when this nine-year-old boy with this kind of black and white moral absolutism that children have, and this, you know, this pantheism, this inclination to see as sacred, you know, all, you know, all of these other creatures, you know, and extend to them that same sense of specialness that the rest of us only expend, extend to ourselves. It, it is also, you know, something that's obviously going to deeply feed his fear and his, and his anger. Uh, and so I think over the course of the story, you know, the, the, the story is launched by this question, what to do with Robin? You know, what's wrong with him? What's the answer? How do we treat him? The story gradually, you know, figure and ground invert. And as Robin continues to put to his father these unanswerable but urgent and essential questions, what is wrong with the adult world? Why are they letting this happen? Why are they making it happen? the shift of the, the, the sense of the, the need for treatment, I think, changes from, you know, from the boy to the rest of us. Well, we'll, we'll talk about the treatment for the boy mm -hmm. in, in, in a moment, but I, I want to focus a little on the, on the philosophical idea that you're grappling with in this book, which, which, and which Robin manifests as the character in it, that 
that there is bafflement that we continue as humans to make ourselves the centre of this story yeah. on this planet. Yeah. That, 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 that is countered in, in some ways in terms of the, the, the plotting device that you use, that Theo as an astrobiologist is somebody who is modelling um, all kinds of... Um, he's tracing the possibility of life on other planets. Mm -hmm. and, and in that context, you are presenting us with this extraordinarily vast... Um, landscape. Mm -hmm. But in the center of it is this idea that you are questioning why it is that human beings continue to think that we are the most important. Yeah. And, I, and I wonder if you'll just reflect on that right. as an idea that has, that has stayed with you from long before you wrote even the overstory. Right. There's so many ways to come at this too. Um, so as Razi had said, Theo's day job, as it were, is astrobiology, and it's interesting to, to point out that this is a field that didn't even exist when I was Theo's age. And, it, and, and he does, he is uh, active in creating computer models that will be useful in interpreting the spectroscopy of, of uh, the, the atmospheres of, of newly discovered exoplanets, looking for biosignatures. Uh, and the field of astrobiology is really not just searching for life out there, but it's asking the question of the affordances and potentialities of life in the largest possible frame. How difficult is it to, uh, to arise in the first place? Under what conditions can it happen? What are the extremes? Can it have different kinds of chemistry? Uh, uh, and all of these broadest questions about the potentials of life um, and it happens that one of the few things that the father and son can do together, a safe place as it were, uh, one of the few things that calms Robin down is for Theo in place of uh, bedtime stories to take Robin on excursions to imaginary planets across the galaxy. And these planets of course are drawing from the uh, exoplanet discoveries in recent decades. Uh, but father and son together visit them and imagine what life might be doing in these very different kinds of places. And this calms Robin because he's so acutely anxious about this idea that he, you know, that by the time he's Theo's age, 40% of the world's species will be gone. Uh, and to, to try to conceive of himself as you know, part of this much larger experiment is a way of uh, addressing his immediate fears that, you know, that this world is disappearing you know, week by week. It becomes, I, I guess, between the two of them, uh, you know, the father who has this intense love for this unusual boy and would do anything to protect him, the son who has this intense love for a mother who's no longer there and wants, wants to recreate her somehow, wants to continue her work, uh, and wants his father to tell, her everything, uh, tell him everything he can about this missing woman so as to, to fix and arrest his memory of this woman. The two of them are actually embarked on this larger question of what is it about us and our social configuration that doesn't see ourselves as part of this story? How did we get into this culture that defines meaning strictly as accumulation? That you know, this commodity-mediated form of meaning, this deep human exceptionalism that says we're the interest, the only interesting act here. You know, we're the only thing with intelligence or agency or, or uh, you know, interest. And it's this question of of. Inheriting this culture of human exceptionalism, where can we go? How can we rehabilitate ourselves and, and, and where we live? And so the, the, the third love story kind of enters in, which is the love that these two lost boys increasingly feel and uh, develop for the more than human world around them. Uh, they're, they're embarked on an attempt to find meaning out there. Tell us about your own personal journey in reflecting on this philosophy, that, mm. that, that somehow the solipsistic nature 
of human beings is such that we we write stories at which we are the center mm. you know we we make stories on you know big screens that that place us at the center so even though there is clearly this tension between this the, you know the boy who really wants to save the world mm. in the way that he felt his mother was doing she was an an activist a lawyer right. who attempted to change change laws in order to to save the the, the planet from catastrophic decline I, I just wonder about tracing it back for you personally when did you first start yeah. thinking about about the the connection that yeah. human beings have to the natural world but but one that makes us much smaller than mm. we like to think we are yeah my own personal discovery uh, uh, of just how human exceptionalist my own biases were. Yeah, uh, I, I've been writing a long time. This is my 13th novel. Uh, my first novel was published in 1985. Uh, and I, would, I, I think it's fair to say that those 11 novels were pretty, they, they, they were pretty representative of a kind of fiction that we think of as appropriate for describing who we are and where we are, uh, but that never ventured very far from the humans. Uh, that is, you know, when I think about these books, they, they basically are, for all their, their apparatus and their, all their attempts to situate human stories in larger contexts, they do inherit that kind of recent Western sense of literary fiction as being primarily psychological, from primarily about the tensions inside an individual person, conflicts of values that you know we might, uh, what, what my sixth grade literary teacher would would have said, uh, uh, man against himself. Forgive the sexist language, but um, or uh, the conflicting values between two people. Is, uh, man against man or person against person. Uh, um, and I had forgotten the third category of this uh, uh, taxonomy, which is people against the environment or uh, in the context of the non-human world. That had kind of disappeared from Western fiction. It had disappeared from my fiction to a large extent over the last couple hundred years because we'd sort of assimilated this idea that we had solved that drama. You know, that all our huge, you know, accelerating uh, capacity to uh, change the conditions of time and space through our technological mediations made that a drama that wasn't interesting anymore. We'd won it. You know, we, there, there, there was no more story to tell, except in a kind of nostalgic a retroactive way, you know, this sort of 19th, you know, look backward to the 19th century survivalist novel or something of that sort. And I had been, you know, a happy card-carrying member of that idea that, that you know, the, the real stories are primarily about conflicts in ourselves and among ourselves. I was also, I think, increasingly depressed, to give you an honest answer that I've never actually uh, spoken out loud in public, but I had uh, changed jobs. I, I had moved from Illinois to California and taken a job at Stanford University in Northern California. Increasingly unhappy with my own work, increasingly unhappy with the prospects of you know, the future in general. And Silicon Valley is an odd place to land when you're uh, uh, a bit anxious about this image of uh, humankind uh, taking dominion over and subduing the earth because when you're living there, you know, and I, I was, you know, I, I, I could step out of my house and walk to Apple headquarters, Google headquarters, Facebook headquarters, name it, you know, it was within walking distance of my house. And that culture, I mean, you cannot go to dinner without somebody telling you, you know, hang on just a little bit longer because we're about to solve the design flaw of death, you know. <laughs> it's all, you know, we're, we're, we're going to handle it, you know. Uh, I mean, that's, that's a, an extreme part of this, you know, uh, transhuman fetish that Silicon Valley has. But the general sense of the technological sublime is really rife there, you know. All problems will be solved by technology. Um, and, 
you know, I think I, I was being crushed by it, honestly. And to get away, I would, I would walk up into the Santa Cruz Mountains, which you know, lie between Silicon Valley and the ocean. And at one time, the Santa Cruz Mountains had been covered in redwood forests that had all been logged. And uh, they were now second growth recovering forests of about 100 years old. And that doesn't sound like much in tree time, uh, but a redwood can do a lot in 100 years. And you know, I would go up there and just marvel at these magnificent, enormous trees and just feel like there was something about the pace and cadence of their life up there that was, that was an antidote and very salubrious to me for what was happening down in the valley. Um, one day, I stumbled across an escapee. I don't know how this tree managed to avoid being cut down. Maybe there was something about the shape of it, or uh, maybe, maybe there you know, was rot inside or something that made it unsuitable for cutting, but it had gotten away from the humans. And this tree was, oh, oh maybe three quarters the width of this room. <laughs> I mean, certainly from that wall to the, to the pillars here. And it was, it was as tall as a football pitch. And I later learned that it was probably somewhere between, uh, it, had, it had germinated somewhere between Charlemagne and Jesus. Right? And I, you know, I was standing in front of this tree saying, I've missed everything. I've missed everything. I've, I've been trying to tell these stories you know, for decades. And there was this intensity and vitality and agency and power in life that had never gotten into my stories at all. And it was, it was really like a, a road to Damascus moment. It was like, wow, I have, I, I have to start again. And that's where Overstory started. And I then spent the next six years of my life reading everything I possibly could about trees. 120 books, I think. Yeah, yeah. And that's just the book-length studies, you know, the, the, the single-topic book-length studies. Um, and in fact, I'm sorry, I, she asked the wrong question because I could do the rest of the evening on this. <laughs> there, there is another book out. I didn't know. ask the wrong question. <laughs> no, I think it's really important because yeah. clearly Overstory is, is the beginning of, of a very different kind of yeah. writing for you. Absolutely. And, and, and this is the next book in that, um, in that project, yeah. um, if you like, for you. So, so it's important to hear you at least explain your own personal connection no. to um, giving agency as a writer That's to right. the natural world and, and, and that feels very important. It was interesting listening to you talking about Silicon Valley and, and, and the, the urgency there to find a technological solution for everything. Of course in the middle of this book, mm. the, the sci-fi part if you right. like, is the potential solution for for Robin right. and his right. the way in which he behaves. So you, you describe something called decoding neural feedback. So just explain what that is mm -hmm. and if there is anything in the world that we know now that comes even right. close to that. Okay. And I'll try to work my way back to the trees later. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, the trees haven't gone away. We're going to keep talking about trees. <laughs> So I first read about this uh, technique uh, called decoded neurofeedback in 2013. Uh, it's, a, it's a very new process. It's still in its infancy. I think, I think it itself is probably a little more than a decade old. Um, and yet, nevertheless, even though it's nascent and, and just getting off the ground, it's produced startling results. And it's, it's currently being explored for a variety of therapies, uh, in particular uh, trauma remediation, post-traumatic -tra stress disorder and so forth. And it consists of using fMRI to film the brain of someone in real time while they're learning a task or engaged in an activity or participating in an emotional state. And the, the, the fMRI is, is focused on a particular area of their brain and the, the neural activity is recorded as a data structure, as a, you know, as a file, the way we would record an audio file or a video file. And that file is used as a template for a second person who's also being scanned in real time. 
and the second person's brain is being scanned in the same location and software is comparing their neural activity to the activity of the template and giving them cues in real time. I've compared it to a, a kind of high-tech game of blind man's bluff. You know, you're getting colder, you're getting, you're getting warmer, you're getting warmer. And the second subject, almost like you know, those, those who have gone far in, say, very you know, kinds of meditative techniques where you just learn how to put your brain into certain states, the second subject is learning how to put his or her brain into the state of the first person. And when I first read that, you know, the hairs on the back of my neck went up because I just thought, boy, give that a few years and you're talking about a kind of computer-mediated telepathy. You know, it's, it's, it, it, the characters in the book call it uh, an empathy machine. Right? And the idea, you know, as, as Theo pushes back on, on uh, psychoactive medication, he's looking around for other things that might work for Robin. And a colleague of his is, is developing this technique. And as Razia says, the book is, I, I wouldn't say actually near future, I'd say near present. Okay. It's, a, it's, a, it's a parallel earth. It's the earth of now, but different. And so as, as the reader enters into the story, they say, oh, I know where we are. You know, we're in 2019 America. And then certain strange things begin to happen. The outside world begins to encroach on Raman and Theo. And the reader now is suddenly saying, wait, that didn't happen. You know, where, where are we? And that, that sense of familiarity with estrangement, I'm also doing that with this technique itself, with the technology itself. The reader saying, wait, is this real? You know, like the little boy was saying to me, are you for real? Um, the, you know, the, the reader saying to, about this technology, could this happen? Is this something that we can do now or two years? You know, will we be able to do a decade from now? Or is this just totally powers inventing this, you know, this impossible thing? Uh, and so that boundary line between the actual and the imagined becomes a bit blurry. But Robin turns out to be a virtuoso of this technique. Maybe because he is different, but maybe because it's kind of like a video game, you know, which he loves. But he's, he's extremely proficient at imitating the, 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 the patterns that are given to him. And suddenly he begins growing in emotional intelligence. And they're his mother's patterns. Yeah. yeah. Oh, so oh, you just gave it up. No. <laughs> <laughs> but it's an important. I'll tell you why I'm, tell, I'm giving that away. I mean, it doesn't. Um, I mean, I knew that before I read the book. Um, <laughs> but so, so it doesn't. So it, do it doesn't often. spoil it. It's not really a spoiler. What I think is no. really fascinating about what you've done with this idea, you know, the the the, the use of it in the novel as a plot dev device is is extraordinarily clever of you mm. because you know when one reads a novel the 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 single thing that i say to people who who only read non-fiction is is that there is somehow this empathy gap and mm. and and it's novels that you know the single artwork i think that allows you to stand in somebody's shoes mm. is the novel yeah yeah uh, you you suspend yourself in this other person's head and to use to use that as a plot device in a novel, I think is brilliant because what you're, what you're basically saying is that in order to be our best selves, mm. that there is a way of being in another person's head to allow us to be the best of ourselves. And in the context of the environment and Robin and his mother, it feels completely vital mm. it feels urgent that somehow in order for us to be able to say look at what we're doing yeah. to the planet yeah. that there, there needs to be this almost um, there needs to be a shift a really profound shift in how we are thinking yeah. and 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 you do that so cleverly and i i wonder if i wonder if you were aware that the plot device that you were using was was actually not just challenging what we think about novels but it was also doing something about the message that you were trying to convey yeah. in that sense it's a kind of alleg an allegorical novel <laughs> yeah uh, ask a writer if they were aware uh, uh, of, of being clever and they're likely to lie to you I think, <laughs> uh, very blatantly but you know there there is a moment i think uh as the reader is following this uh, drama of what will happen to Robin and, and 
uh, how will he change as he uh, increases in emotional intelligence through this uh, technique of, ima of imagining himself into the brain of another person, that the reader does say, wait, I I'm imagining myself as Robin. I'm imagining myself as Theo. I am embarked in this same leap of empathy that's being described in the story. So there is a kind of recursive way in which the, 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 the act of reading the book is a recapitulation of the story in the book. Um, there's a line in the overstory, all the best arguments in the world won't change a person's mind. The only thing that'll do that is a good story. And you know, for those of you in the Conduit Club, you, you've run into this, right? I mean, you show graphs and you, 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 know, you rehearse the statistics and you make the arguments, the rational arguments, and you know, the, the audience says yes but no. You know? uh, and this idea that somehow narrative, an empathetic leap, can be more capable of moving a person effectively and, and changing their belief systems than argument is actually borne out by clinical psychology. You know, there, there are uh, uh, lots of studies in, in which you simply ask a person, you know, what would you do in this circumstance? You know, if, if you were this guy trying to raise this boy, you know, and the boy asked you this question, you know, how would you answer? And, and later on in the course of the, these controlled empirical studies, the people who have been asked to do that empathetic leap are more fundable. They're, they're, they're more capable of saying, I, you know, maybe I need to rethink this. So I, I agree with Razia. I think, you know, novels are, along with all, you know, other forms of art, in particular narrative art, are going to be the thing that starts to trigger, catalyze, the transformation of consciousness that we're going to need if we want to stick around here much longer. Well, well that, that brings me to my next question. So if, if, if you believe that, I, I wonder to what extent you, you despair of politicians who, on the whole, don't read novels. Mm. And, mm. Um, you know, I mean, some clearly do, but, but, but those people who feel that the, the thing that they are embarked on on a day-to-day -day basis, this, the, the power that they have, mm. the desire to make the changes, ideological or otherwise, that they are embarked on, far more important to them than thinking beyond the next election cycle. Yeah, there are, there are people with enormous power in this world, right? immensely disproportionate power in this world. But they're not just politicians. I mean, they're also the people who run huge companies. The companies you mentioned. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, imagine one human being who's running a company that's more powerful than most of the nations on Earth and who has a golden share in that company and can override all his shareholders. You know, that's, a world, that's the world that we're living in. That sounds like sci-fi, doesn't it? But it's not. But where do those people get their power from? And you know, the, the answer is we concede it. You know, by, by, by being willing participants in the culture and the, the, the way that the culture has defined meaning and the way that the culture has defined purpose, by subscribing to that and, 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 and being the, 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 the willing consumers of, of everything that these companies have to sell, we are ceding that power. So if our politicians don't read, or if Mark Zuckerberg doesn't read fiction, we do read fiction, right? And this transformation is going to have to be bottom up to some extent, to some extent, because they will follow what their markets dictate. And, and I, I, it sounds hugely idealistic, and I, I know this group is at least uh, uh, partly open to the idea of, of gross idealism. Um, but when I think of other social transformations, you know, and I, I actually learned this by, by um, uh, some fo from some folks in, in uh, 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 Extinction Rebellion, you know, that 
the, the, the triggering moment in, in the transformation of consciousness is actually lower than we think. Um, there is a kind of contagious spread to the stories that we tell about ourselves. Once our artists and our writers and our, and our narrative practitioners begin to see a new way of representing ourselves and where we are, it does spread contagiously through the population as a whole. And we hit these trigger points where suddenly, you know, we start to say, what were we thinking? And you, you know, in my head, as I'm saying this, I'm thinking of something like uh, LGBT, you know, that if you had asked me when I was Theo's age, what are the prospects of same-sex marriage ever being legalized in the United States, I would say, do not hold your breath. This is an immensely conservative co country. They do not know how to think about things that fall that far from their own expectations. And the politicians will never move because the people won't move. But you see, you start telling stories. You know, you start to write plays like Angel is, Angels in America. And you start to make films like Philadelphia and TV shows like Will and Grace or however you want to tell this story. And then all of a sudden, the, the consumers of narrative and you know, the public at large are mass consumers of narrative, right? We can't get enough of it. They start saying, these people are just like me, right? And it, it's, I'm, I'm simplifying a little bit, but my sense is that this impossible revolution, the seemingly impossible revolution of a few decades ago, actually hit that trigger point and there was a cascade and almost overnight we're in a new place where the mainstream public is saying what were we thinking of course of course uh, okay i mean it, it, let's just put the idealism to one side but i just wonder about the extent to which you think or, or the extent to which you're you're frightened about how slowly mm. that narrative impulse yeah. is manifesting itself when it comes to climate change it's certainly the case now that so you know for example a few years ago on the bbc on news programs we would we would still be having climate change skeptics on against sure. people against the scientists we no longer do that because the consensus is that we accept the science mm -hmm. but that took a while yeah Right, because the, the impulse of, culturally, the impulse of, of journalism was, well, surely there's another side to this story. Mm -hmm. um, so, so although there are just a tiny minority who say there is another side to this story, and, and it's touched on in your book, right. because the, the politics of this America is there with a, a president who uses social media and Twitter in mm -hmm. particular, and, um, you know, and, and we know exactly who that's modeled on. But I just wonder about your, your anxiety you talked about trauma for young people yep. and eco-trauma, and, and there have been reports that have come out very recently about that. But, but what about your anxiety, given that you put so much of your faith in, in, in the narrative being one of the engines of change? Right. For a long time, my own sense of despair and trauma was very high. I hinted at it earlier. And partly because I did have a, 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 a layperson, a scientifically inflected layperson's understanding of the enormity of the crisis that we're facing. But I was also, I think, demoralized by the presentation of the climate crisis as a crisis in physics and chemistry, atmospheric chemistry, engineering, uh, you know, parts per million, etc. And I thought, what are you asking us to do? You're asking us to give up meaning in order to get a number down. That story didn't make enough sense to me to think if this is ever going to be able to get traction among the people that I know or any people. And. I, I did despair. I mean, I, I, I thought often of the famous Frederick Jameson quote, a lot of you may know this, it's easier to imagine the end of the world than the end of capitalism. Uh, and he's right, right? And here we have been very actively imagining the end of the world for a long time now. 
but not the end of capitalism. And the, it, it, became, it, it became increasingly clear to me that the kind of eco-trauma that we're talking about is the trauma of people who don't realize that they've been so colonized by this idea that all meaning is personal, that all meaning is accumulation, that we are separate from the rest of creation, we have this kind of uh, God-given right to pursue our program, and now we're being asked to reduce meaning, reduce consumption, reduce that program. Uh, it doesn't, it, 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 it's not a saleable thing, and, and that's where my despair came in. We're, we're trying to save the socio-political formations that we're in right now from the consequences of those socio-political formulations. That's, that doesn't make sense. And, and I think, you know, I, I, to do this in a nutshell, you know, and I, I think we have to start telling our children a new story as well. And the story is, it's not, the future is not going to be like this. We won't be able to save this culture. But maybe that's not the worst thing in the world. We will go through great upheaval, great change, great pain, great suffering, lots of death. But life will survive. It has survived every mass extinction. It will survive anything that we throw at it. We are likely to survive, not in the current configuration. We're not going you know, we're, we're to get over the finish line with all our stuff, right? But we, in our infinite ingenuity and you know, this, this uh, uh, amazing uh, capacity of projective intelligence, are going to be able to find a place in that future world. Now, if you define hope as a willingness to commit to engaging the future, and if you say the future will be filled with life and we will be there and there will be the possibility of rehabilitation, of reconnection, of reformulation, of locating meaning out there, then there it is. Endless work for us endless, meaningful work for us that's more rewarding than where we've been looking for the rewards in this culture. But from everything you're saying, your, your, your underlying suggestion is that the, the fact that we're not moving fast enough is a profound failure of our imagination, our collective imagination. It is, uh, but I also see a rapid acceleration of, of the realization of that as we've moved this question from this hypothetical thing we need to save our children's world to every day I'm waking up to headlines showing that it's now, right? And I, and I think, once again, I think it is very possible to imagine that public wherewithal and public consciousness will transform relatively rapidly um, and you know, could, could actually lead uh, uh, in, in this struggle, you know, we'd, we've been petitioning our leaders and our, uh, you know, the, our uh, captains of industry to lead this fight. And, and maybe it's going to happen in another way. I, 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 I want to just dwell a little on the, the, the system that we think we are wanting to save. So, so the capitalism that is propelling us towards our doom is still the thing that we want to that we want to save somehow i i wonder how you how you convince a politician of of shifting their emphasis given that it is the only system yeah. that we that we still seem to revere yeah you you vote that politician out you know i i, I think I, yeah, if, but even even the alternative politician well, is going yeah. to hedge his or her bets True. and is going to be thinking about the next political cycle and the next election, yeah. if but, not for themselves, for their party. But if they have their fingers in the air and, and the air is changing, then then the 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 political curve, you know, the, the starts to shift as well. You know, I'm 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 putting this in the best possible, casting this in the best possible light because, you know, my, my point is not that we can do what we need to do in the amount of time that we have to prevent massive upheaval because I'm not sure we can. But is that a cause for infinite despair? No, because once we begin 
to think of, of our purpose and our meaning as landing back on Earth and locating our own destinies and our own pleasures and our own purposes beyond us it doesn't, in, in a sense, we can do that right now. You know, we can have an increasingly robust sense of the, of the gratification and the rewards of reconnecting to the more than human world. And that will lessen the anxiety that we have about how difficult it has been to galvanize any kind of consensus to save our existing culture. So you see what, where, where my, my idea of what a parent can do for a traumatized child you know, comes in. If you can tell a child there is meaning, there is beauty in the world around you, find it, nurture it, understand it, study it, love it, and that's good, that's enough. And yes, scary things are happening, but it can't, it, nothing will take that away from you. I, I'm not sure that any other message about, no, we're going to, you know, the, the cavalry is going to come in at the last minute, we're going to have, you know, we're going to find some technological fix. I'm not sure any other message is going to be of much comfort to, you know, the nine-year-olds who are in a panic, the 20-year-olds who are saying, what's the point? Time to open it up to the floor. Um, I'm not sure if we've got microphones. Yes, we do. Um, questions? Thank you so much. Um, I have a question about sort of, you mentioned eco-anxiety at the beginning, right? And there's a strand that would suggest that a growing number of people are trying to imagine yet more sinister views to the end of the civilization in order to hasten the end of capitalism. So what I mean by that is basically eco-anxiety, a lot of the people are driven by the fear of mass human extinction in the next hundred years or something like that. It's probably one of the slimmer of good news in recent IPCC report that some of the worst possible scenarios, four degrees, five degrees of global warming are not really happening. Mm -hmm. Still pretty bad though, right? So the question in a way for people who are sort of have this sort of narrative responsibility, mm -hmm. how do you see the balance between you know, scaring people as opposed to giving people hope? Yeah, yeah, carrot and stick. <laughs> and and the, 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 the reality is you don't have to choose between those. The stories that you tell are going to have to acknowledge and, and participate in that entire spectrum of human response. And, and as we storytellers realize that we have to, you know, we, we no longer have the luxury of participating in human exceptionalism and you know, being preoccupied with these private psychological dramas, there will be both scary stories and encouraging stories. Um, it, it, if, you're, if you're asking which is more effective, I don't, I don't really know. But it, it may not matter, so long as those stories of, of all kinds begin to be told. You know, and, and we begin, Robin Wall Kimmerer in her, in her book Braiding Sweetgrass, which I recommend very highly, uh, talks about becoming indigenous again. You know, and those are the kind of stories that we have to start telling. We have to, we have to tell stories. You know, for, for most of human history, in most places of the globe, we would never have thought that we could say who we are without bringing in the neighbors and without treating place as real. You know, uh, and is it, you know, it, will those stories, you know, if, if they dwell only on the positive, will they be of use? Probably not. If they dwell only on the negative, will they be of use? Probably not. But, you know, we make our, our way forward through lots of different course corrections and lots of different experiments. And, you know, our storytellers will have to experiment with the ratios between those two ways of, of motivation. Thank you very much. I haven't read your new book, but I've read The Other Story, and it's one of the best books I've ever read. No oh, blessing. I, no, no, really, I loved it. It's such a transporting book. Um, I want to go back to the question of who leads us. How do we, how do we get better leaders? Um, you chose to, your first reading was about this boy who's mm. been qualified by doctors as, as an oddity, uh, or, or worse, right. you know, diagnosed basically. And his father says, but actually he's a marvel. He's got so many skills. And he sees things, and he smells things, and he has capacities that other people don't have. He should so he's the wise man. Why are we led by mediocrities who are normal 
And people, it, how, do we, how do we square this circle? How do we get these, the people who have vision, the clairvoyance, yeah. to, to be in charge? Yeah. Well, it will not have escaped the notice of this group uh, that a, a child uh, identified as neurodivergent who's deeply anxious about the culture, who's demanding adults uh, <laughs> explain what's happening, that there is, a <laughs> that there is a, a source for such a person. And, you know, it, it, uh, there is a cameo in, in the book uh, that is, is drawn very clearly as a I wasn't sure whether I should intervene yeah. and say, yes, yeah. she does make an appearance. But here, here's the thing, you know, it, this, this book is clearly uh, preoccupied with diversity and difference of all kinds. And, you know, as Robin is deeply anxious about the diminishment of the living world and the fact that, you know, by the time he's Theo's age, all, these, all this diversity and difference is, is going to be, you know, hugely uh, diminished. Um, the book is also clearly, you know, the, Robin's anxiety about eco-diversity and his, you know, his campaign is, I'm going to draw pictures of all these endangered species and I'm going to go to the farmer's market and I'm going to sell them. And, and I'm going to collect this money and I'm going to, you know, to put, put it toward these good costs. So, you know, he's actually propelled into, into some kind of meaningful activity. The, the reader watching this boy is saying, you know, we're trying to normalize kids like this. We're trying to bring them back into the fold. And you know, Greta is saying, wait a minute, my difference is my superpower, right? And, and it's that assertion, I am going to use this other flavor of being human to, to put it to you who are, who are there in the mode or the mean of the, 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 the distribution curve to say, you need us to, to help tell these stories. You, you know, we're only going to start to turn this corner if we stop trying to create this normative sense of what we need or who we are. We're going to just, you know, we're going to have to use the superpowers of di divergence and difference. Uh, to help us think differently about who we are. I, I wonder though to what extent you think the anger that Robin displays as well as the anger that Greta Thunberg displays is is valuable in telling that story because yeah. it's clearly starting to be dismissed by politicians. I mean I interviewed a, uh, an Italian politician who specifically, you know, there were a whole bunch of um, environmental activists who went to Milan to, to talk to the Italian <coughs> government. It was kind of pre the COP26 meeting and, and he, he was basically saying, well actually they, it, it's, it's not always helpful to, to militate in this way. Yeah. So I wonder to what extent yeah. you think that this is this has to be part of the story. And, and it, well, going back to your question in a way, right? We're re rephrasing, recontextualizing your question. Well, in my story, the, the watching Robin move toward a state of bliss and a state of well-being is the catalyst, right? It's not the anger. It's the sense of, I'm happier now than I was. And it, it, it's clear to me, as I move through my life, it's those people who are saying, I have found a way of thinking about what we might be and what, I, what, what, what allows me to sleep deeply and, 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 and uh, robustly at night and what makes me wake up in the morning and feel eager and, and, and engaged by. You know, those are the contagious people, right? And, it, you know, if, if you have experienced the kind of interbeing that Robin learns to experience, where your purpose is this greater purpose of the, of the life experiment, right, there are lots of things that can't be taken away from you, right, and that's robust as well. I'm not, I'm not going to dismiss altogether people who will be motivated by indignation, because there's a lot to be indignant about. You know, the young are furious at us, and there's a good cause. Right? But psych again, clinical psychology points to the belief that it's, the, it's 
it's feelings like ecstasy, you know, the, the well-being and uh, positivity that are the most contagious. And, you know, if a story can use that as a hook, if we can show um, uh, possibility, you know, it, 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 it greatly increases the reader's a, a, a ability to empathize, empathize and say, hey, yes, please, me too. Yeah, count yeah. me in. Yeah. Uh, more questions. Hi, thank you so much for talking to us tonight. Um, I'm fascinated by this idea that we've touched upon a lot at the beginning of the conversation about creating a literature that doesn't just privilege humanity and the human condition as the only story worth telling. Um, particularly as it relates to, I guess, our place in the natural world or, you know, nature's kind of place in us. And there's a line actually in the over story that is just the one that has just stayed with me so much and just seems to encapsulate this entirely. And I think it's when Ray's been read novels when he's kind of paralysed in bed. And he has this thought, you know, to be human is to confuse a satisfying story with a meaningful one and to mistake life for something huge with two legs. No, life is mobilized on a vastly larger scale, and the world is failing precisely because no novel can make the contest for the world seem as compelling as the struggles between a few lost people. That seems to sound like the challenge you set yourself yeah. as a yeah. writer. Yeah, and, and how to negate that belief you know, how, how to find stories that we can learn to be compelled by. Yeah, that's, that's where I am now. Yeah. So it is possible. Well, uh, it's, it's, uh, it has been possible for me to learn how that kind of story might be written. And it has been possible for me as a vicarious uh, consumer of other books that are attempting that to be moved deeply by them. Um, so yes, I mean, we, 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 we respond strongly to what we know well and what we've been trained uh, to love and to recognize. And this process of, of, of uh, re rejoining ourselves to other streams of literature um, is gonna take a while, and it's gonna take a while to build a readership for it. Um, but, you know, there, there will be practitioners with superpowers, you know, uh, who have already twigged that in their own difference and, and have already spent a lifetime imagining these other kinds of stories, and they will move us. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you. You've given me hope. <laughs> <laughs> um, hello. Actually, moving on from that question, I have a question about form for you. So you clearly feel charged with your pen to change the world, and you've spoken about how changing the narrative is, is it's how we change things from the bottom up. But you know, you've been nominated for the Pulitzer. You've, sorry, you won the Pulitzer. You've been nominated for the Booker Prize, which are clearly huge honors and great accolades. But have you ever been, have you ever been tempted to write in a different form, perhaps something more popular, or try your hand at screenwriting in order to get your message across in a different way? Mm. I thought I was trying something more popular. <laughs> 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 Certainly more popular than my original eleven novels. Yeah. No, I, I, yeah, no, I, I, I do think it's probably going to be film and 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 television and the like where where this is really going to get traction. The way the way it was with these other social revolutions that we were talking about earlier. But I, I you know, I, I let a thousand flowers bloom. Let everybody do what they can. And you know, I, I've, I'm, I'm 64. I'm a bit late to, you know, to the game. And I, I've learned how to do certain things. And you know, my, my job, I think, is to take what I've learned and to move it uh, as robustly as I can into this other place. But you know, you, you, you bring up an interesting point, which is. You know, you said you clearly are moved to, to change the world with your pen. And I would say to, to change how we think about ourselves with, the, with, with my pen. And in some ways, that's almost like an accusation in literary fiction, right? I mean, you see it sometimes in the reviews for these books. You know, um, this is advocacy literature. And that's somehow a second-rate thing. Um, 
or even that it's science fiction in part and therefore not yeah. literary yeah. in merit. And, and isn't it interesting that literary fiction has for so long ghettoized science fiction and treated it as a, as a second-rate genre that's crude and, and uh, you know, primitive and colonialist, what have you. you know. um, whereas in reality, it was simply that part of our literary production that never gave up telling stories about that third kind of drama that I was talking about earlier, people in the world. Right? It, you know, the fact that it wasn't primarily interested in psychology may in, in the, the phrase of my old profession, computer programming, not be a bug, but a feature, right? <laughs> and and uh, I don't mind now. You see, I'm not, I, I, I think I'm beyond apologizing for the fact that I'm not interested in using my talents to create another example of this kind of morally ambiguous, uh, space where all characters have to be both heroes and villains, and one must never feel uh, the needs or the urgencies of the author. You know, everything must exist in this kind of deistic universe. You know, we have a lot of that, right? And and you know, I think literary fiction and and the, those people who are trying to preserve that sense of moral autonomy are preserving a privilege. You know, and I think they need to loosen up and 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 realize that. You know, the times they are changing, right? And and there there are going to be new stories that we need to tell for a new world that we're he are, you know heading into, hurtling into headlong. Yeah. I, I think you're doing that now. I think you write novels with ideas at the heart of them, but they're with heart, mm. and so that makes them deeply enjoyable as novels, but they have ideas yeah. at the core of them. Which the, is the ultimate goal would be to find a story where ideas and feelings are no longer considered two separate things mm -hmm. that don't influence each other and that aren't constantly in a, in a perpetual in, interrelated network in our own brains. You had a question. I do. Um, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. I, I like how all these questions are kind of segueing into each other because I have a bit of a fanciful question about the creative process. Mm. Um, I, I love both of your stories. I love that, um, you know, ideas with heart. That's such a great way to put it. Mm. And when you were describing both your um, kind of inspiration, the little boy, are you for real? Mm. You know, um, for people who know, and then also um, you discovering this amazing tree in the um, around Cal in California. Um, it kind of reminded me of maybe Nemus a little bit, that inspiration. Absolutely. And um, for bo in both cases, I got goosebumps. Hmm. And it made me think of a story that Elizabeth Gilbert tells in Big Magic, where she talks about how she had a story that had come to her, and she was really, really trying to write it, and it, it just wasn't working. It was kind of like you were talking about your writer's block. block. And she finally decided she just had to release it. Hmm. And then she had met up with her good friend, another writer, Anne Patchett, who maybe some of you guys have read that's great. Um, and Anne Patchett was telling her about the story that she was working on about the Amazonian forest and, and medicine and, and tribes down there. And, and that was exactly the story that Elizabeth had had to give up. Hmm. And she said it's like the universe had you know, <laughs> found another recipient for it and given it to her friend. Yeah. Um, they never discussed it. And so I guess my fanciful question is, do you feel in any way maybe sometimes these things might come to you because you're receptive and kind of the universe is kind of able to speak to you, not in a religious way, but just in a, a frequency kind of, yeah, mm. you may be kind of channeling some of this stuff. Like, I love the beginning of your book, you know, listen, there's something you need to hear. Yeah. It's kind of the same way. Yeah. I, I think that, that things tend to be in the air, right? And it has to do with the fact that the affordances of the moment are perceivable to people paying attention. And we read each other's stories, and we're inspired by each other's stories. Uh, but novelists, and I, I, I think Elizabeth and Anne are roughly the same age, you know, uh, who live in a culture and are consuming the same anxieties and hopes and fears, it's not surprising that they, that, they, that they twig, you know, they hit upon ways of, of thinking about these things. You know, the, 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 for me, that movement 
that, that movement from writer's block to release. I should say, moving to the Smokies, writing the overstory, writing the ultimate, has, has changed me with regard to process, with regard to writer's process, has changed me even more profoundly than I was suggesting earlier. You know, for most of my life, you know, for those 11 books unfolding over, you know, a third of a century, I was a dedicated producer because, you see, in this culture of, you know, commodity-mediated meaning, you have to pr produce and, and you have to consume, and that's what keeps the economy going. And, you know, we forget what, you know, Gaylord Nelson says, that the economy is a wholly owned subsidiary of the environment and not the other way around, right? So, you know, I, I would say I am not, leave, I, I write in bed, so I was going to clean this up and say I will not leave my desk, but I'm going to be honest with you. I will not leave my bed <laughs> until I have a thousand words. Right? And that's how I live my life. You know, that's how I wrote all those books in relatively, you know, a good clip. And, and I, can, I defined myself as the producer of this work. And then the overstory happened, and the overstory moved me to this, you know, this place, a new place on the other side of the continent. And all of a sudden, my job when I woke up in the morning wasn't to be a great producer of anything. It was to see what's going on here. And you know, now when I wake up, it's what's the weather like? And what season is it? And what's in fruit and what's in flower? And where are the animals? You know, what elevation are the animals? And where would be the best place to go out and be present and attend to what this place is trying to do? Right? And that's what I do. That's my job now, right? Um, and of course, when I'm out there and doing, you know, you know, attending and watching and learning, this is happening, you know, and, it, and I can't be out there for very long without scenes and voices and characters and so forth, because that's the way I organize the world. But the point is, the relation, the, you know, what the tail, which is the tail, which is the dog has, you know, uh, has, has inverted. Um, and I think that is a source of deep and rich meaning, even in the city, even in London to say, to live where you live, not in an imaginary space that's transacted entirely in these you know, uh, humanly invented commodities of, of consuming and producing, but to say, what, does this, what is this place trying to do right now? You know, and, and this is a sort of trivial example of this, but uh, I, I arrived last Sunday. I went from five years of living in more or less solitude in the Smoky Mountains to Heathrow Airport, uh, and as the old joke has it, the first step's a doozy. Um, and uh, then on to the uh, Penguin Random House flat uh, in Pimlico. And uh, on the first night, uh, it was foggy with jet lag, I was wandering around uh, the neighborhood. And you know, if it had been at any other time in my life, I would have said, good Lord, Westminster Abbey. Oh my God, Houses of Parliament. You know, it, it, and, and now it's, it was, look at that catalpa tree. How, you know, how did they get this to grow there? And, and, and look how magnificent it's, look at the, these plane trees, you know, and, 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 and all the, the, the fruit that these trees are putting out. You know, and, and that's a trivial example, but the pleasure of living where you live is transformative. And, and allow all the other things that you need to define yourself by to grow out of that, you know. Unless somebody has another question, I would say that that's a perfect point at which to... Ah, good. <laughs> Richard Powers, thank you so much. I, I, I just wanted to say that, that there's something that I read when I was um, reading about you, as opposed to reading the books that you had read, that you, know, you talk about reading as a secular prayer. Yeah. And, and there's something so just profoundly moving about that. And, and, and I kind of want to just leave people with the with the thought that, that we have in our presence a public intellectual for whom noticing, writing, and reading is so central to his life. And, and it's not hard to make it central to ours, even if you leave out the writing bit, if you're not a, a someone who's keen on writing. That, that, that idea of, of reading and noticing feels vital. 
in so many ways. Could I add one word to that, Razia? So if reading is secular prayer, being quiet, being attentive, petitioning, being, pres being present, attending, um, then the relationship between the writer and the reader is religious. And by that, I mean, religion has been co-opted in so many ways. It's now the handmaiden of so much of, of the culture of human exceptionalism and uh, identity politics and uh, you know, group loyalty. But in the deepest sense, in the etymological sense of that word religion, I mean, think of the Latin roots, religio, to tie back together. That's what we need. You know, we need something that's going to tie us back to each other and to the rest of the more than human world. Richard Powers, thank you so much. Mm -hmm.